Hi everyone, welcome to week five. Um, just a really short lecture today um, on employment and income maintenance. As you know from topic five, which is on social security, there's a lot of um, information within your learning module uh, that touches on a lot of different things this topic and I think it has really nice um, crossovers into lots of the other uh, fields of practice that we speak about. Uh, this session. So not too much in today's lecture, uh, but you will see the correlation, especially between um, this topic and topics we've spoken about previously this session as well. So your reading for this week is chapter six of the textbook, um, as well as some additional readings within your learning modules. I've just popped a couple of really quick statistics on this slide. Um, myself, I'm not very mathematically minded and I find statistics all a little bit overwhelming sometimes. So I tried to choose some pertinent statistics that really um, paint a good picture of what we're talking about when we talk about employment and um, income management and social security. So these statistics are updated monthly by the ABS um, and these are from June. So um, employment increased um, over that month to um, 12,160,100. I'm going to, that will be the last number I read in entirety. Uh, very tricky for me. Uh, unemployment decreased, which is great. You can see the correlation there. The unemployment rate is at 5.6% um, and the participation rate remains steady. So the participation rate's a really interesting one to get your head around and, and please look it up if you need further clarification on this. So it's at 65% basically. Uh, for me, it didn't really sit right. I'm like, mm, well, wh what does that mean? I know there's lots of people out of work and a lot of people not working. Your participation rate is based on those who are firstly of the eligible working age, um, not those who are above retirement age. Participation rate is those who are of working age and who are actively um, wanting work. So it excludes those who don't want work or who perhaps are unable to work. Um, so please have a look at that um, term to get a bit of an idea about what they, what is meant when we talk about participation rate in the workforce. Uh, because if we use that rate alone to think, oh, that's great, 65% of people um, are in employment and that's looking really wonderful. Um, it's uh, you've got to take a lot of different things into consideration there. Um, unpaid work. So I think this is an important consideration in our field and one that's often um, overlooked in society. But unpaid work covers a variety of activities, such as voluntary work, domestic work and caring for others. Um, I really like this stat from the Unpaid Work in Australian Economy in 19, 1997. Sorry. Uh, it said that unpaid work is estimated to almost half of Australia's gross domestic product. So that domestic work, that volunteering work, makes up almost 50% of our GDP in this country, um, which I thought was really interesting considering, um, as I'll explain further on the lecture, how undervalued it sometimes is. Um, so since 2006, you will all notice that within the census, there's um, four specific questions relating to unpaid work. Um, previously, this wasn't counted in the census um, and wasn't acknowledged. Um, so the questions are, which you all may be familiar with, we've only just completed a later census. Um, first one relating to time spent on unpaid domestic work in the household in the last week. This is that question gets all that media attention post census. So um, the question you see the results for saying, oh my goodness, what a shock. It's mostly women doing unpaid domestic work and even those engaged in full-time work are then doing an additional, say, 15 hours per week of domestic unpaid work. So um, it, it's a question that has got a lot of media attention over the years um, for lots of different reasons. Another question being time spent on providing unpaid care, help or assistance to a person with a disability, a long-term illness or problems related to age within the last two weeks. Time spent providing unpaid care to their own or other people's children, um, aged less than 15 over the last two weeks. Again, that was that's one of the domains where it's saying, well, look, we've got this huge cohort of people engaged in full-time work. And then on top of that, they've got these massive caregiving responsibilities, which I think would 
resonate with a lot of us within this subject. Um, I know from your introductions and talking to you throughout sessions so far that many of you are juggling, say, full-time study, full-time caregiving and full-time work, um, which in itself is just crazy. And, and how do we do it and how do we get through it? Um, and at least now the census is recognizing that. I think moving forward, um, as we as a country, as we keep getting this data and getting this knowledge around how many hours are spent in all of these domains, I think social policy really needs to respond to that and really needs to listen to that and really needs to understand that in thinking about policy and legislation around workplaces and the average working week, for example, is something that I think may need to be reviewed in terms of caregiving responsibilities and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, in an ideal society, we hear about these beautiful, um, quite often Scandinavian countries that have this great work-life balance um, where there's shorter working days or fewer working days and more time spent in this unpaid domestic type work. And I, I think in a lot of ways that could be seen as the ideal, but I mean, our social policy hasn't really caught up with what society looks like at the moment. But I think these census questions are a nice step forward. Um, so the fourth question there is time spent in unpaid voluntary work through an organisation or group within the last 12 months. And obviously that question is quite integral in getting figures such as the one above about um, where does unpaid work contribute within society and what is that contrib contribution? So these are just some <clears throat> reflections of my own. Um, uh, although there's inherent worth and benefit within unpaid work, largely I believe that it's under acknowledged and underappreciated. Um, with employment being a key factor in determining one's standard of living, um, what happens when one's not in paid employment? Um, some really interesting things to think about and reflect on is um, as individuals uh, in our personal lives, in our professional lives, and, and, and as practitioners within the field. So um, my head's blocking a little bit of this um, heading here, but this slide's titled Income Maintenance and Development or Decline of the Welfare State. So the nature of the capitalist system in which we all are living and working is that there are, is a reserve, an army of labour not in paid work. Um, the welfare state developed to ensure that all members of society had a reasonable standard of living. Um, the term reasonable is quite interesting. Um, and of course, uh, those debates around the minimum wage and, and what is a living wage. Um, so the notion of redistribution of wealth was an underpinning idea in terms of the development of income maintenance, um, as well as an aim to protect vulnerable members of society. So there are two models of social security, uh, the residual model. So the residual model is one where an individual effort is rewarded. Uh, wage earning is a foundation for social security and some people miss out. It's a conservative model. Social citizenship model is a more collective approach to social security. The idea being that everyone deserves a decent standard of living and access to basic social goods. It's a universal model. So thinking about what we know about the social security system in Australia, where do you think that sits? Do you think it's a nice mix of both? Do you think it's sitting somewhere in the middle? Or do you think it's really at one end of the model, um, say sitting within the residual model? Or do you think it's more of a social citizenship model? Um, have a think about that and reflections of your own. Um, so there are four trends indicating a need for bold change to social support systems and these were outlined by the Workplace Reform Reference Group in 2000. Um, they identified a growing gap between the rich and the poor, a growing number of children living in families where there's no adult and paid work. They identified changes in the mode of work, that there was more part-time work and part-time jobs were being taken up by households already with one wage earner. Uh, they identified that there was a growing proportion of the population relying solely on income support. They also identified a decrease in the availability of unskilled jobs and impacts of technological change and globalization. So as you can see, this report was 17 years ago now. Um, do you think that these trends are still continuing? Do you think they've changed a little? Um, or do you think they're quite accurate still? A quote from uh, this reference group in 2000 was that Australia's social support system must do more than provide adequate levels of income support for people in need. It must ensure 
that people are actively engaged socially and economically, including the labour force, to reduce the risk of long-term social and economic disadvantage for themselves and their families. So the group was really arguing that, you know what, people do need income support. That's fair enough. We need to eat, we need shelter, we need income support for those in need within our community. But it also argued that there was an inherent need for individuals to be engaged socially and economically in the labour force and that in doing so it would reduce social and economic disadvantage for themselves and their families. So it's an interesting concept. It's saying that no, we can't just provide income support, but we, we need to get these individuals engaged uh, for many other reasons. So what do you think the underlying assumptions are of a quote like this? How far have we come since this statement was made 17 years ago? Have we not come very far at all? Or how do you think we've come leaps and bounds? What are some of the latest statistics on wealth distribution in Australia in 2017? Um, Oh, like I said, I'm no statistician myself um, and not very uh, good at sort of um, embedding those statistics in my mind. But I do know that it is 3% of people in this country who um, have most of the wealth. Um, and that there continues to be that huge gap between the poor in this country and the most wealthy. Um, so I'm um, answering the, own, the statement at the bottom there. So is a gap between rich and poor decreasing or increasing and I think the relevant literature says really that it is continuing to increase. So a little bit more history for a change. My lectures are always covering sort of a bit of a chronological timeline of things but in developing those base knowledges around the field I think it's really important to have a bit of an idea about um, how things develop and where they come from and where we're going. Um, so the role of social work within social security um, and the income support bureaucracy. Uh, started really in 1941 with the development of the Department of Social Services or the DSS um, and a government inquiry recommended at that point that social workers be employed, I think for many obvious reasons in our minds probably. Um, in 1944, a social worker was appointed as Chief Research and Administrative Officer um, of the Division of Social Work and Research within the DSS. In 1947, a paper at the first Australian Conference of Social Work outlined the Department of Social Services social work role. So that paper talked about the role of social work within the DSS as casework and ensuring that bureaucracy was as humane as possible, which I think is a beautiful notion, um, and to provide social research as well. I think if we think about the role of social workers within um, social security this day and age, it's quite quite similar in a lot of ways, uh, with a little bit more of a counselling focus. We'll talk about that further on as well. Um, in the 1950s, we saw the active recruitment of social workers into DSS, um, as well as cadetships offered. Um, 66 saw community li liaison, oh, I've got a typo there too, sorry, and service development role. Um, in the 70s, we saw expansion of social work under the Australian Assistance Plan. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just that typo's thrown me now. I'm gonna have to fix it up before I put the slides up. In '73, um, in the DSS, social workers enabled to assist community organisations development and coordination at local level. So it was a bit of a decentralisation at that point and more community level focus for the role of social workers within the Department of Social Services. Um, throughout the late 1970s, uh, there was a growth in social work numbers, especially in regional offices. Um, social workers were in integrated across the Department of Social Services um, with an income maintenance focus, but also a move into policy and admin functions as well. Um, in 87, we saw state offices of the DSS abolished and rather more regional areas developed. In 19, 1997, sorry, Centrelink was established um, and saw a significant change in the positioning of social work. So um, the manager of social work who was elevated to a senior executive level at this point and social work direction strategy was developed, a focus on customer service relationships and emerging technologies, as well as enterprise and practice review and service delivery um, policy. It was at this point we saw some services privatised too, especially those employment services. 
Um, Department of Social Security, as I said, lost departmental status. Um, so that sort of began in the 80s and then by 98 they lost departmental status altogether and became an arm of Department of Human Services. And as a result of that, the role of social work and service delivery was really broadened. So if you go to um, the Department of Human Services website currently, you'll see that um, there's a whole page dedicated to social work role and it's actually one of the activities in the forums this week to discuss what the role of a social worker is, say, in Centrelink. Um, so from the website, um, it says our social workers can help you with short-term counselling, information to help you and referrals to other support services. So already you can see sort of the ground level social work role changing a bit over the last 20 to 30, 40 years. Um, oh, so sorry, I've, I've flicked forward there, but there's some references from this week's lecture. Um, a couple of references from the ABS. For any of you who are sort of more in touch with your statistics than I am, it's got some really interesting things on the ABS um, about the Workplace Reform Group, of course. Um, and I haven't actually popped the center link, link on the references page, but it is just back here. So thank you for listening to the fairly brief lecture today on income support and social security. And I'll talk to you all again soon. Bye.